Saints, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord again. We thank God for you, particularly those who are watching online. We thank you for your presence today as we just seek to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. We thank you for um, choosing our online service to do that. To all our Middle Belt Baptist uh, church members, we greet you as the new year comes. We, we expect it to be in the house face to face, but we're not. But we're going to continue to press forward in spite of. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 9. Psalm 9. If you're in the word, Psalm chapter 9 is our call to worship scripture of the day. Psalm 9 says this. I will thank the Lord with all my heart. I will declare all your wondrous works. I will rejoice and boast about you. I will sing about your name most high. When my enemies retreat, they stumble and perish before you. For you have upheld my just cause. You are seated on your throne as a righteous judge. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have erased their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to eternal ruin. You have uprooted the cities and the very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He judges the earth with righteousness. He executes judgment on the nation with fairness. The Lord is a refuge for those, for the persecuted, a refuge in the time of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you because you have not abandoned those who seek you, Lord. Sing to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Proclaim his deeds among the nations. For the one who seeks an accounting for bloodshed remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the oppressed. Be gracious to me, Lord. Consider my affliction at the hands of those who have hated me. Lift me up from the gates of death so that I might declare all your praises. I will rejoice in your salvation within the gates of the daughters of Zion. The nations have fallen into a pit they made. Their foot is caught in a the net. They are, have concealed. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment, snaring the wicked by the works of their hands. You notice that the word says, sing to the Lord in verse 11. Why do we sing? For all of his benefits that he gave us in this text. All of his protection, his provision, his, his power, his compassion, his mercy. We sing to him for all of who he has been to us. And it also says in verse 1, I will thank the Lord with all my hearts. So I pray and ask that we have brought a thankful heart to this service as we all stand up and as we praise, as we sit in our family rooms, kitchen tables, wherever you're at listening, you can still praise despite the fact you might be by yourself or you might be just with your family. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, I come before you. I thank you and praise you for our service today. Thank you for your wonderful psalm that gives us encouragement, that tells us that we should sing to you, Lord, and praise to you and pray to you and just lift you up, Lord, and trust you for all things. I pray and ask that you be with us as we glorify you, that you would be with every part of this service today from song, from prayer, from announcements, from anything, from sermon. Be with us today. These things we pray in nice son Jesus' name. Amen.
I've watched my dreams get broken In you I hope again No matter what of the hills and valleys indeed. Amen. Thank you, Sister Mary. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, NBC. Good morning, online guests. It's the second Sunday of the new year, and God has blessed you and me to be on this side of the dirt. I hope you said thank you as you opened your eyes this morning. I know I did. We need to thank God every minute we, we receive on this side of the dirt. Let us look to the Lord for prayer. Father God, I come to you this morning thanking you for simply waking us up another day. Thank you for being such a forgiving God. Forgiving us daily for sins of thought, sins of action. Lord, so many comment when the new year comes. New year, new me. I submit, Father, that and ask that you remind us that it doesn't have to be a new anyone. You're looking for a different me not a new me. Lord, help us to turn away from the spoils and confusion of the world, only to look to you for everything we need to exist and do the work of making disciples, living a life that pleases you, asking for forgiveness daily so we don't get consumed by the wickedness and sin. There are members of our, of our church community and our social media guests, Father, who are dealing with sins, known and unknown. In this moment, I ask, Father, that you forgive us all. Help us to do better, Lord, especially as we learn, grow, and develop as Christians who know better. Lord, we lift your name on high, thanking you for grace and mercy that none of us deserve. Father, in 2 Peter 1.3, you tell us that we have everything we need in you. Help us each to fully understand that you, the great I am, have already made provisions for all of us. Lord, you continue to keep your promise while we sin daily and think we're safe. 
There's so much going on in this world today, foreign, domestic, and, and local. Please use your faithful few to spread your word and make more disciples to win the souls of your children, Father God. Lord, we pray for members of this congregation that are in special need, Father, whether it's financial, whether it's uh, an illness that's, had, that's taken place and taken over their body, Father God, whether it's a, 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 a home where husband and wife are feuding, Father God, we need you to intervene. Lord, where kids are getting sick daily, we need you to intervene. You know the needs, the needs of uh, the family who, or, or people who are at work, our spiritual needs. Oh God, we pray that you would, by your grace, reveal our neediness to us, to one another, and reveal to us your fullness and your faithfulness. I pray for your perfect love to expel all fear, doubt, and anxiety, worry from anyone within earshot of my voice, Father God. When we think about all that you are doing, not only in our church community, not only in this community of Inkster, Father God, but throughout the world, Father God, when we think that all that you are doing more Christians need to stand in the gap and fight for what is right and true according to your word, not according to our truth, what we think is our truth, but your truth. Help us, Lord, to defend the faith and not cower to Satan's foolishness. Father, help us in a way to remember to give you all the glory and reverence in all that we do and all, we, all that we receive. It is only through you that we exist. I thank you for your grace and mercy again, Father God. I ask that uh, in this moment, if there are prayers that need to be prayed from anybody individually, Father God, that they take the time to do that, to just say thank you, to just say thank you for being the God of the hills and valleys, for allowing us to breathe another, take another breath, for allowing us to just look and see the sights and wonders that you created. Lord, we thank you. In your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Givelify is giving simplified. Givelify is the simplest, most beautiful way to give and track donations to the place of worship or charity of your choice. You're not limited to the cash you have on hand. There's no need to write checks, and there are no complicated forms to fill out or text message codes to remember. Givelify automatically pinpoints your location and intelligently identifies the fundraiser, worship service, or conference you're attending without the need to search. Since Givelify automatically detects where you are, making a donation can be completed in as few as three taps. Tap 1. Use one of the pre-configured denominations to choose your donation amount. Tap 2. Select the campaign to which you'd like to contribute. Tap 3. With your stored credit or debit card, complete your donation in one tap and get an immediate donation receipt. Setting up recurring giving is a simple two-tap process. Tap the frequency you'd like and you'll never forget to make your gift. Givelify lets you easily see your complete donation history. Mark the place of worship you normally attend as your home for quick one-tap access. Givelify. Tap. Give. Done. At this time, uh, <clears throat> like to also remind us that in giving, uh, there are <clears throat> essential things that a church needs to continue to do the work that God has called for us. So let us uh, remember that we have ways to give, Givelify, which is uh, an online or you can give through your phone. You just search for our church name <clears throat> so that you're able to give. And if you uh, happen to come up to the church and there's, uh, you have an envelope, you can stick that envelope uh, in the slot that's in the, at the back of the church uh, to, uh, to give. But we want to encourage, I want to encourage us to remember, giving is one of those things that it's not a task, it's something that God desires for us to do so that we can continue to take care of the, uh, not only the church, the local community, but we can give where necessary with those who may be in need. Let us look to the Lord for our prayer on giving. Lord, I'd just like to thank you for putting it on our hearts and our minds and helping us to remember that the money that we receive daily, the money that we receive through paychecks, through any, any way, it's yours, Father God, first of all. 
And I just pray that uh, we remember that and we not use those financial gains that we have as a second thought to give to a local church community. Lord, I, I just ask that you convict us where necessary to give first, not give second, not give after we bought all the shoes and purses or colognes or whatever it is that we want. Help us to give first, Father God. Because it's important that we continue to do what we can financially to help our church community or any church community to progress and help those in that area. These things I ask in your gracious and merciful name, your son's name. Amen. Saints, I'm just thanking God again um, to be back in the house I missed last week and um, just need to rest up. Um, I come just praising God for the wonderful praise music today that our sister Mary got us started off with, God of the hills and the valleys. Now this week, saints, I'm going to kind of continue on what I preached two weeks ago when I introduced the Just Do It kind of series. Just do it, beginning of the year. We used that as a theme, just doing it, in 2022. And we came out of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. And this week, we'll be in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. If you're there, I'd like you to turn in your word to Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says this. Not that I have already reached the goal or I'm already perfected, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of it by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, having been taken hold of it by Christ Jesus, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do Forgetting what's behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, just help us today as we go into your word and dig a little more. Just dig a little more on this issue of just doing it in 2022. These things I pray in thy son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Saints. Your past, what you've gone through, can sometimes become like a doorstop. Whether you're still rehearsing past failures, whether you're still living in past successes, whether you are reliving an offense that was done to you, they all have the effect of killing our spiritual momentum. We all know the importance, saints, of detaching ourselves from painful past memories, yet we pick them up often like bad codes. Why is our past such a chain to us? For some, it's, it's pain, it's trauma. For others, you made a horrible mistake 15 years ago and you still relive that in your brain. For some of us, it was our past successes. Maybe we were all stating or maybe we got a scholarship in college and we just tell that story all the time. People know our story better than we know our story. People hear it. They, they hear about all your money and all the success you've gained. All of that is past stuff. Why does our past become such a chain to us? Why does it keep us from future victories? I think there are some keys in the text, and I'm going to give you one of them. It is found in Revelations 12 and 10. I want you to go there. Last book of the Bible, huh? Revelation 12 and 10. Now, Revelation 12 and 10 says this. Online audience, I want you to follow along as well. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. It says this. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven. The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and authority of Christ have now come. Because, watch this, the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. So what you have in this, in this text is an eschatological 
future prediction of Satan's downfall. And what it says is the accuser of the brethren who accuses the brothers and sisters before God's throne day and night has been defeated and thrown down. Now watch your terms. They call Satan the accuser of the brethren. Now, you can only make accusations against a brother or sister based on past events, not future. Watch. So that tells us that Satan's role, even now as we speak, as we speak and preach right now, he is probably accusing me in front of God saying, he don't need to be up there. He's committed too much sin to be there. He did this yesterday. He did that the week before. He did this the week before. Why are you letting him preach? It says in the text that he stands before God's throne. Look at the text. Accusing us before our God day and night. So that lets us not just me, the saints online and brothers and sisters. It didn't say preachers. It says that Satan keeps our sins in front of God's face all the time. Now, it is safe to assume if he keeps our sins in front of God's face, he would also do the same to us and keep our sins in front of our face. Satan realizes that is a very effective tool to keep people focused on past events rather than future events. If I can get you to just remember your stumble getting pregnant out of wedlock, if I can get you to remember uh, 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 getting kicked out of school because you got bad grades and you're, you, you're so caught up in that failure, you won't even go back to school and try again. If I can get you because you had a failed marriage and messed up to not, not, not I'm never be getting married again. If I can get you just to remain in that position, then you are ineffective for Christ. Ineffective. Now, it's happened to all of us. It's happened to me, everybody in the room has either for some season of their life let some past event keep them from future victories. Now, last week, we said these three points. Paul says, I mean, the writer of Hebrews says, lay aside weights and sins and encumbrances. Encumbrances are extra flesh. If we're going to run this marathon, we need to be as skinny and as in shape as we can. We don't need any extra weight pulling us down. I would argue that in this text in Philippians, our past sins, successes, whatever, can become a weight that keeps us from running a strong marathon. What else did he say in Hebrew? He said, you got to look, you, you lay aside every weight and sin that so easily beset, besets us. Let us leave. Let us run. Got to get up. Got to get up. You got to get up. You got to start moving, right? And then it says, let us look to the author and finisher of our faith Christ Jesus. Now let's go back to Philippians. Now let's now keep those in mind as we're going through this because Paul is augmenting or supporting the writer of Hebrews. Let's look at Philippians. Go back to Philippians chapter 3, uh, three verses 12 through 14. Let's do just a little touch of work. See what's going on in Philippians. We don't have time to exegete the whole book, but we will do this chapter. Verses 2 through 3. Paul says, watch out for the dogs. Now who is he talking about? He tells us, watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. What is Paul talking about? He is talking about Judaizers. He is talking about people who have come into the church. He had to deal with it in Galatia, and now he's dealing with it in Philippi. He calls them dogs. Now, dogs was the term Israel used to call Gentiles. Paul is using it now to describe false teachers. Same word. They have come into the church, seeped into the church, and said this. I know Paul has preached that if you confess your sins and believe that God has raised them from the dead, you will be saved. I know Paul said, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I know that. But there's other parts to it. Here's the other part that you didn't get. Paul didn't mention this. You need to be circumcised. Mm. Look at the text. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. That's what he's talking about. He is talking about circumcision. Then he says this, for we are the circumcision. Because Paul is clearly saying the physical circumcision that happened in the Old Testament was clearly symbolic of a New Testament reality. And what is the New Testament reality? 
is not that God is circumcising male genitalia anymore. He circumcises our heart. That's the, that's the symbol right there. Paul is saying, you, you got it all messed up. So a person getting circumcised will not save them if they uh, have not committed their life to Christ. You just adding circumcision to your body will not save you. You must have a circumcised heart that saves you. And if a person has already confessed Jesus, sincerely, their heart has already been circumcised. They don't need to do, they don't need to do anything else for salvation. So Paul is dealing with that now. Now, verses 5 through 6. Now, these, look at look, look, Paul, he's something else. You got this proud group of preachers and leaders, proud. We do this. You're not doing it right. You're not doing it correctly. This is what you need to be doing. You always got to watch folk who say stuff like that. You always got to watch people who add stuff to salvation. You better be very careful when people say, well, yeah, you got to commit to Christ. Yeah, we know that. That starts it. But you got to do this, this, and this to continue or be saved in the first place. Be very careful. Look at Paul. Paul said, okay, y'all, y'all got the, you think you're talking about something. Let me give you my religious pedigree. Verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Regarding the law, a Pharisee regarding zeal, persecuted the church regarding the righteousness that is in the law. This world, watch what he says right here, blameless. Regarding the righteousness that's in the law, he ain't saying perfect, but he said, I have kept short accounts and I daily keep the law. That's what he's saying. So Paul goes over his pedigree. So, so for these, we say you fake preachers. Let me go over what a real Jew looked like, circumcised eighth day. I'm of the stock of Israel. You know what that means? Straight line, no mixing. You understand? I'm of the stock of straight line, no mixing, no dibble dabble. He said, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. That is an elite tribe in the, out of the twelve tribes. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrew. I, I never mix pagan religion with Judaism, right? I'm a Pharisee concerning zeal. I person not only did I do all those things and I had the pedigree, I actually killed people on behalf of Judaism or played a part in them being locked up. That's Paul. After the law, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not eat unclean food, thou shalt not, you should wash, you should wash the utensils. You shall uh, uh, kill an animal every, you know, day of atonement, uh, uh, religious festivals. I kept them all. The, the Feast of Purim, the, the Feast of the Tabernacle, the Feast of Booth, I kept them all. Now, based on my pedigree, who brings more to the table than me? That's what he was saying. Then Paul becomes an accountant. First he said, this is my resume. Now let me be an accountant. Look at verse 7 through 8. But everything that was gained to me, I consider it to be lost because of Christ. More than that, that's what grace is. There's a grace right there. I also consider everything to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I might gain Christ. Why? What you say? All the things, my, my resume... All the things that have become part of who I am, my identity, it's all a loss. Kick. All my past stuff, lost. All my accomplishments, lost. All the things that I stacked up, lost. More than that, I consider everything to be lost, Paul said, in view, right? Paul says, now that I see Christ, and now that I see his standard, now that I see his grace, it don't mean nothing anyway. It's lost, and I don't care about it. Because I, of him, I have suffered, right, because I am now committed as a Christian, and I recognize that it's by grace you say, not of works, right? So because of him, all the things that I had stacked up, I consider them, look at the text, y'all, and underline your Bible. I consider them as dumb. Y'all, that, you know, that's manure. That's poop. That's doo-doo okay. for those who are unclear. But you got to understand, I, I got to say it. We, we cannot, Paul used the word, not me. 
We can't, that is critical because when you start to look at your past accomplishments and all that, as doodle, you might be willing to let them. Don't nobody sit around in a bathroom and not flush the toilet. We all get up and flush the toilet because we want to move on from what just happened. Am I right about it? Huh? In the same way, Paul said, that's what I consider my past as. So maybe in 2022, we need to start looking at our past like human feces instead of all of these good things we did and even the bad stuff you did. It's just human feces. Move on. Flush it down the toilet and keep going. Seven through eight. As we go to, and then as we, no, actually 12 through 14. After he goes over his pedigree, then in verse 12 through 14, he changes his focus, saints, from religious success because he, he had built his house on religious success. He said, I need a new foundation. So what's going to be the new foundation of his house? The new foundation, saints, is spiritual maturity. Paul, spiritual maturity became Paul's overriding purpose in life. Not missions, not the mission of the Lord. All of those things are important and they flow from this. But the most important thing to Paul was spiritual maturity. Grow up. Grow up. I want to grow up is what Paul said. He says this. So as we move, let me give you something to hang your hats on. Success in the Christian life is measured by your ability to keep your eyes focused on Christ and his desire to conform us into his image. That that's, if Paul's focus is spiritual maturity, our individual focus should be spiritual maturity and growing up. Grow up. Grow up. Now, the name of this sermon is Let It Go, but it probably should have been Grow Up. It's Let It Go. Part of growing up is letting things go. But if you look at the text now, he's about to give us four, I did not say steps. Y'all know I have an irritation with any book, article, four steps to this, three steps to that. I don't think that the word is that um, rigid and that kind of, this is not a step-by-step -step YouTube on how to get a grow up. The word is not written that way. These are principles, okay, not steps. I'm not about to give you a get-rich-quick scheme. I'm about to give you some principles that if you apply them, then they will lead to spiritual maturity. Let me give you the first one. Effort. <laughs> Just effort. Raw effort. Look at the text. Not that I have already reached the goal or am perfected, but I make every, what's your text say? Effort. effort to take hold of it because I have also been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. So Paul says, not that I have obtained this or already have been perfected. A sanctified dissatisfaction is essential to having success in the Christian race. Watch this. Watch this. A sanctified dissatisfaction is essential to have being strong in the race. Here's the sanctified dissatisfaction. I'm doing pretty good, but I could go faster. I'm, I'm, I'm in good place, but I could do more. That is a sanctified dissatisfaction. We never want to get to the point where we like, I'm good. Ever. Amen. Don't never rest mentally, emotionally like that. Don't ever get to, things are going all right. I'm going a, I'm to a coast right now. You know, y'all been there with y'all the lost gas before, right? You wasn't always rich. And if, you can, if your gas was leaning, you get that boy up to about 70 miles an hour, and then what would you do? Let me see if I can coast to the gas station, right? We don't want to get out there, right? And, oh, I'm good now, right? And then coast. You never want to coast as a Christian. So look at Paul. Where do I get this from? He says, not that I have reached the goal. He says, or oh, have already been perfected. Paul starts off, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not there yet, right? So Paul always kept a sanctified dissatisfaction where he was in his walk. 
You hear football coaches talk about this all the time. Football coaches, no matter how, they could have just blown a team out 50 to nothing. They say this, as they celebrate, they, they yell after the game, give out a game ball, and then that evening, on to the next game. On to the next game. And they'll say, they'll say things like this. We are striving to play a perfect game. We haven't played that yet. Basketball, football, I don't care what coach, baseball, we're striving for a perfect game. We haven't played that yet. So they're always keeping the team forward. So in the same way, Paul is saying that's how we need to live. Now watch. Not that I've already retained. Paul said, I ain't, I'm not claiming perfection. He is admitting right there, y'all, that the Christian life is a fight. Yeah. We went over that last two weeks ago. It is a dog fight. It, it, sometimes you hear the word uh, uh, farming. You, the Christian is sowing and reaping. Sometimes you hear the word uh, a soldier in Timothy. It's, it's, a, it's a fight. It's a, sometimes you hear the word wrestling, right? So, and sometimes you hear running. So those are the metaphors that are used for a Christian walk. Planting like a farmer. You know, you know, tilling, right? Planting and waiting, right? That's the Christian life. Then it's shooting and being a soldier and being on point all the time. And then it's wrestling and fighting. And then it's just running. Why would they use those metaphors? Why would they use those vivid metaphors? They would use those vivid metaphors to help anybody who thinks being a Christian is going to be a cakewalk. It is a fight, right? Paul is saying that. Now watch, let's move. He says this. But I pressed. Did he say that? Well, I give effort. He says, I, I, I press, but I, I make every effort to take hold or, or pressed towards the mark. Some translations use press. What does that mean, press? It means to use steady force or bear down. It's, it's like tug of war. You remember back in the day, tug of war when we was little, right? You dig in, right? You get, your, get the good grip, you get the good grip on the ground, and you, you know, right? Or, or it's like, I don't know if in the gym you saw people now, they, they stack weights on a sled, and then they get down, and they get this pose on the sled, and they just pin their head back, and they push the sled with full of weights. Paul is saying, you got to get down there, saints, and you got to get your arm on the sled, right? Get your head down and push, because you got to do this, it's going to make you strong and it's essential to your Christian walk. Effort, saints. Effort. You're not going to grow in Christ sitting on the bench. You're not going to grow in Christ for folks that I don't know why I'm not growing in Christ. Um, do you read the Bible? Mama. Not really. This is simple. This, this is not rocket science. Two plus two is four. I'm not really growing in the Lord. He's not doing stuff for me. Have you, do you pray? Well, over dinner, that don't count. No, I'm not saying that. It counts. But if that's the extent of your prayer life, that's not good. Well, I do study the daily bread. The daily bread is like the deviled eggs they feed you before a barbecue. It's like salad, right? It, it, good, but it ain't the barbecue and the chicken and all the greens and stuff. You understand what I'm saying? And you look, yeah, we get, look, get you a little devil there. Get you a little quiche and an appetizer. That's all good. That's the daily bread. You're not going to grow, saints, if you don't have a regular diet of God's word. Yeah. And a regular, consistent prayer life. I'm speaking to myself. The first place Satan attacks me when in my walk is that I notice that my devotions start to be less rigid and my prayer life is less rigid. In some areas, y'all, you got to be rigid about your prayer life and your devotion time. When I say rigid, I mean that is God's time. It is not anybody else's. Amen. Even if you're married, it's not my spouse's time. I got to get away in the word. Effort, saints, effort. Amen. In 1986, a group of researchers published a study of Japanese mothers and mothers in Minneapolis. The mothers were asked to rank the most important thing that a child needs to be successful academically. This answer tells you a lot of difference between the two cultures, Japanese and Americans. The mothers in the Minneapolis chose ability as the most important. The mothers in Japan said effort. Effort can overcome lack of ability. 
Effort can overcome deficiencies in knowledge. Effort can overcome any kind of deficiency if you're just willing to put the time in and be consistent. Saints, every project, goal, dream, or endeavor all started with effort. Take yourself back if you now have a bachelor's degree. Somebody had to fill out the college application. I hope you did your own. In my house, we did our own. If they didn't, if they didn't get in, it's because you didn't do it. So effort starts with calling and seeing if you got into the school. It, call, it starts with maybe getting a job when you get there so you can maintain your tuition. It starts with working. It starts with getting up and studying. It starts with, I'd rather watch TV, but I got to open my study. I got to do my book. I'll be here for 12 years. I want to graduate. Effort, right? Look at anything you've accomplished, and all of them, all, all, all of them required effort. Nobody gave you anything for free. Spiritual maturity is a lifelong goal, saints. Keep pressing. You have not arise, arrived. So effort and spiritual maturity is a lifelong goal. Keep pressing. You haven't arrived. Second principle. You got your first. I just need some effort. Just effort. What, what can I do? What can I do? Start reading your word this year. 2022, start to go through the Bible. I'm not about to tell you you need to write, read the Bible in a year. I'm just saying start reading your word. Start praying consistently. And then, then watch what the Lord does. Second principle, you need a short memory. Short memory. Look at 313. Remember, I'm giving you principles. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. Watch this. One thing I do, forgetting what's behind and reaching forward to what's ahead. Boy, this jumped off the, this jumped off the page on me. I know this text. I have preached this sermon other places years ago. I know this portion of the text. This helped me in the midst of studying. Look what he says. Let's read it again. It preaches itself. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. Paul says this. If you don't know how I say this, if you don't remember one thing from this sermon, remember this. Mm -hmm. Forget what's behind. Reach forward to what's ahead. Paul says, I have not reached my goal of perfection or spiritual maturity. Let, let, let me play with that word. We got it. It's hanging me up right now. Perfection. Paul says, I'm, I'm striving for perfection. When, when, when we think of perfection, we think of you never sin. And, and in some ways, that's what this leads to. But the actual word means complete or mature. That's what the word means. So when you think of the word, think of it like a mature banana. A banana has a life, right? But if you catch it at just the right time, right, that banana is now mature. So it's like this. It ain't ripe yet. It ain't ripe. It ain't ripe. It ain't ripe. It's ripening. It's ripening. It gets to its peak, and then it starts to go down. So Paul is, is going to say, be like a ripened fruit, fully mature, right? That's what he's saying. We should all be striving for that. Now, what that leads to is less sin. What that leads to is a Christ-like focus. What that leads to our sinlessness. We're never going to attain sinlessness on this side of the grave. So Paul is saying, I'm, so, so when I say I'm using Perfection and spiritual maturity synonymously because they, they're generally the same term. Grow, grow up, right? Now, look at this now. Paul says in this text, I do not regard myself as having laid of it. I want you to keep focusing on that. So there's work to be done individually, corporately, in our marriages, in our family. You're not the best father you can be. You're not the best mother you can be. Keep moving. Keep moving. But let me tell you the biggest key to you moving forward, Paul says. The biggest key is a short memory. Now, forget. Forget means to ignore on purpose. Mm -hmm. To ignore on purpose. Right? Out of all the four points in this text, y'all, this is the critical one in verse 3. One thing I do, Paul says, that's an interesting phrase. The great apostle Paul tells us the keys to spiritual success hinge on our ability to forget what lies behind. Now, let me clean this up. 
Paul is not talking about a lack of knowledge of past events. Once you have experienced something, generally you can't forget it. So he's not talking about a lack of knowledge of past events. I know all of the sins that led me to getting saved. I know pretty much to remember the sins that I've committed, not all of them because there's so many of them, but the, the dominant ones in my life that have been a stranglehold for me since I've been saved. I still remember them. I know that in 2021, I did not use my time as valuably as I should have. I still remember that. that that's not going to go out of my mind. What he's saying is, don't let the sting of it or the condemnation that is associated with it or the guilt of it go to 2022. And he is not saying that we shouldn't reflect on our past to learn what we did right and how it went and to learn from the things we did wrong and how it went. All of us should be using our past reflectively to know how future things can come. Well, I did this in the past. I went to a test and I didn't study, not one, and then I came in there and had a nerve to pray about it and I got a D. So was it a lack of faith? Or was God trying to teach me a spiritual principle? Faith without works is dead. Well, the lesson is, don't go into a test that you haven't studied for. Don't forget that. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's not saying no. That's a lesson learned. What he's saying is, don't let the, the weight of your past mistakes, that heaviness, that guilt, that condemnation and conviction to keep you from going forward. Use your past. How many times in the Old Testament did you hear Christ say this? Remember the God of your father, Isaac, Jacob, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, don't forget that. He tell them this. He say, Joshua, before, after, you know, I spit the Red Sea, before you go to the next part where I'm going to point to you, set up a memorial for me. Set it up. Mm -hmm. Now, why would he do that? Because God is leaving a trail of historical good works. So, in other words, he, God expects us to look back at how God has brought us through. He wants us to look back at how God gave us grace when we need it. He wants us to look back at how he got my family through some tough times, financially, emotionally, physically, whatever it is. He, he don't want us to forget that because we can then extrapolate how good God has been with us in the past and now assume that he will continue to be good for us in the future. Yes. Are you following me? That ain't what he's talking about. He's talking about the weight, the conviction now, if you're still being convicted about past events, it may be because you haven't repented yet. Right? It may be because you haven't repented. So I'm not asking God to get rid of the conviction if you haven't dealt with the sin. Am I right about it? Amen. Repentance must happen. But if you have sincerely repented, you have sincerely confessed the sin, right? God said if you, you know, uh, if you, oh, I forgot to say this, 1 John 1, 9. Uh, basically, uh, that uh, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, right? If you confess your sins, he's faithful to, con to, to, to co cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Once you have done that, Paul says what? Paul says what? Let it go. Leave it in the past. Forget what lies behind. Forget it. Let's look at Paul. Let's be practical. Let's look at it. Let's look at two times in his life where he failed and his successes. Let's go to his past failure. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10. Follow me online, please. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10. It says this. This is Paul talking. He says, for I'm the least of the apostles. I ain't even worthy to be called apostle." Because I persecuted the church of God. Look at him. Now, Paul's about to answer, how did I get past that? How do you get past a, a, a past so distraught and so horrible? He says this, by the grace of God, yes. I am what I am. Hallelujah. And his grace towards me is not in vain. On the contrary, since I've gotten so much grace, I work harder than anybody else. Yet not I. It ain't my personal strength, but the grace of God that's in me. Amen. So how did Paul get, you know, Paul killed and locked up godly saints. 
One of the most godly men, Stephen, he helped and assisted them stone, Stephen. How do you get past that? Lord, what well, I hope none of y'all have been part of a murder. Paul was. Not just a regular murder, a murder of a martyr, a, 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 a pillar of the church. How does one get past that and it not affect them for the rest of their Christian walk? Paul says this, grace, Amen. grace, Hallelujah. grace, grace is what helps us forget and helps us move on and helps us to, Paul, not in, I'm embracing who I am, right? Grace gives me the ability to see it in God's eyes instead of my own. Paul, I don't deserve none of this. He said, but I work even more because of the grace that was bestowed to me. But he said, my work and my effort is not of myself, saints. It's not because I was strong. It's because God's grace is in me. So you see the text right there. How do you get past past failures? Y'all answer for me. How do you get past past failures? Grace. Grace. You remember Peter, right? Y'all, Peter messed up. Jesus' road dog, Peter, James, and John. It's my three boys. Jesus said, you're going to deny me. No, I ain't. You're going to deny me. No, I ain't. <laughs> Peter, just listen, man. I can hear you. Just stop. Stop. Be quiet in front of me. You're going to mess up. No, I'm not. They may. What he said. The other 11. They may. I can't speak for them cats. But one person you don't have to worry about is me. Now, three, four hours later, he denied our Lord. I don't even know that cat. I don't know him. Three times. It matches his, his proclamation three times. Three times. Three times. And the last one, Rooster cried out. Peter knew he was wrong. The text says he wept bitterly. The strongest word you can use in Greek for weeping, that's what he did. I'm talking about that old school one after you got a spanking and you lost your breath and you was like... You, you remember that one, right? You didn't have no breath left. You didn't have to whoop so bad. You just cried yourself to sleep. That's how he left that situation. For 40 days, Peter was running from God. Went back to fishing. Wasn't no mission no more. Man, I'm about to go fish. Jesus caught him at the shore. John 20. He caught him at the shore. He says, feed my sheep, Peter. Feed them. That's great. That is grace. That's the last person should have got the call. That's the last person who should have got the commission. And that guy just less than six weeks prior, he, didn't, he, he fumbled. He threw an interception. He messed up. And God come in, Peter, feed my sheep. The commission and call hadn't changed. Mm. Feed them. Then 10 days after that, Pentecost. Peter gets empowered, goes out and preaches a sermon and 3,000 3, folk got saved. How else could the man six weeks prior who threw an interception and turned his back on the Lord and walked away from him six weeks later preach a sermon that 3,000 people get saved from? I'm going to tell you one thing. I bet he entered that pulpit a lot more humble than he was before. <laughs> I'm a lot more dependent on the Lord before, a lot more on his knees before. Now it's God using him, not Peter, in his own strength. Now, that was Paul's Let's look at one of his successes. Look at 2 Corinthians 12 and 7. 2 Corinthians 12 and 7. That's his failures. Let's look at his successes. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Let me get there myself because I think I might want to pick up in verse 6. I don't like to jump in. 12. I'm in 12 now. Let's see. Verse 6. For, I, for if I wanted to boast, I wouldn't be a fool because I would be telling the truth. But I will spare you so that no one can credit me with something beyond what he sees in me or hears from me. Especially because of the extraordinary revelations. Therefore, so that I may not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a measure of Satan to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Let's deal with that. What's Paul saying? Verse 6. I, I want to boast, and I could. He said, I wouldn't be a fool if I did. But he says this, verse 7, especially because of the extraordinary revelation. What is Paul talking about? Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. Paul 
went up at least one time, we know, either physically or in a vision to heaven. And he wrote about it and said, I saw stuff I cannot even repeat. Paul in this text is saying, if one person may have the justification to boast, it's me. Anybody in this audience or online have more reason than Paul? He wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Nobody but Paul says all of that basically don't mean a thing. Even though God spoke to him you know how we God spoke to Paul. You know how we say, I, I sense God saying something to me. When we say that, hopefully, we are saying, I didn't actually hear him say that, but he impressed on my heart. And normally what happens when, it, when we hear that is some scripture or a principle that you got from the New Testament. That's what's happening. You just don't realize it. Damn, I feel this strongly to, to you know, to call this person, Right? That's a principle, you know, basically in a reach out and check on your family and, your, and other Christians, and your brother and sister in Christ. But Paul received one-to-one -one revelation. In other words, he was taught, Paul's seminary professor was Jesus for, for his whole education. And he says, my past successes and my past failures all mean nothing for the surpassing glory or greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Yes. Wow. What did, this is just powerful. He said, even in success, now, saints, I've talked mostly about failures. But successes are the same. Successes can keep us, our, our spiritual successes, our job successes, our family successes. You, you met Christian families before, right? who can't cease to brag about all the things their kids have done. I am all for you telling me, hey, uh, Ron Ron graduated from school. I'm so happy he got his engineering degree. Praise God. But why we got to talk about that 15 years later? <laughs> 15 years. You know he graduated back then. You know he got his master's degree. Yeah, we, we already brought him in front of the church and clapped. You remember that ceremony? <laughs> but yeah, I just want to make sure you remember. Huh? You know my other daughter... You know, she, she did this. She's got her law degree now. Oh, well, praise God. Praise God. Now, you see them two weeks later. You know, my other daughter has a, has a law degree, and they just bought a $200,000 or $800,000 house. That's what, the, that's what this text is talking about. Paul is saying this. Don't build your life on the successes of you, your family, or your children. Because you know what it is? Let's go back to the rhythm. It ain't nothing but human feces. Amen. That's what it is. Amen. Stop building your hope your life, your identity on your kids. Amen. I have kind of taken the approach to honor my kids, but, but not to constantly say what they've done. It ain't healthy for them, and it ain't healthy for the person doing it. Let them grow up, stumble, make mistakes, and get back up, because that was the trajectory of my own life. That's the trajectory of all of our lives. Boom, 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 and falling. That's all of us. If you haven't fallen, it's because you don't understand sin, and you're not willing to admit your life is not what you say it is. Your past successes and failures, keep them the same way Paul did. Paul said, I could boast. I, if, 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 there's anything, if, if one person can live in the past in a Christian walk, that's Paul. Paul said, I can always, and hey, you know I wrote Philippians right. <laughs> you know I wrote Galatians right. You know I was a, you know, I wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians. That was me who wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Just, just don't get it twisted, you know. And, you know, you know, I was one of the apostles. You know, I was one of the 13. 13 men. Only 13, basically, apostles, right? Not the other cats now that you see with an A in front of them. They're not apostles. Basically, 13 men, apostles. Paul is of that group. I'm, I'm with that group right there. He can do it. He said it's human feces. It's dumb. It's foolishness. Oh, saints. So many Christians are like the oak tree that said in the fall of the year, I am perfectly satisfied with my year's leaves. Therefore, I will not allow them to fall to the earth. I will hold on to them. As a result, the north wind blew and the leaves faded, but the old oak clung to its last summer leaves. 
In that unsightly condition, it passed the whole winter through, the wind rustling through the dry, dead leaves. Thus it is with many Christians. Instead of allowing their past experiences to fall, they cling to them and do not prepare for new and better experiences as they may come daily. It is only by the tree shedding its leaves that it can hope to put on the beautiful foliage in the springtime. That's present-day parables. Saints, forgetting your past. So let's apply this. Those who can't get past their sins, right? This is for you. We got different categories. This is for folk who let their sins keep them from future victories. Why do we do that? We draw pride from our false humility. Pastor, what do you mean? This is the person who, I messed up, I can't, you know, I can't please God, I, I can't, I, I'm condemned, I, I messed up, I, I don't feel like, I feel like that mistake. Now, on the outside, they look very spiritual. They look very, they look very serious about sin. On the inside, what they're saying is, God's salvation and grace can be bought by me doing good, which is a form of pride. Right? The outside, they look very, this sin, I, no, I can't. Hey, sister, would you, um, I really think you got a gift to sing. I've heard you, I sit behind you. Girl, you can sing. You ever thought about joining? I can't sing, Pat. I can't, I, 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 got, I had this, I had a baby, um, and I just don't feel right being up there. Sounds spiritual, because it sounds like they're serious about sin. What they're saying is, down deep, I don't believe God's grace is sufficient. I don't care how good it sounds. I don't feel his grace is sufficient. God says that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from unrighteousness. Did he not say that? He said that. So in the fact that you still are allowing a past sin to keep you from serving, to keep you from evangelizing, to keep you from advancing God's kingdom is a form of low-key pride because you have a poor understanding of salvation. And I'm talking to myself. I understand salvation. I understand it from the text. I understand it intellectually. For it's by grace you've been saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? I understand that you, you don't get it by works, but how do I actually practically live? That means my mind still needs to be renewed in this area, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. I still need to, to really get my mind around grace. Yes. I still need to get, that's why Paul says uh, a lot of his um, benedictions or his um, doxology say that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Are you getting more grace? No. All the grace you needed, you got when you got saved. Hallelujah. What you need to do is grow in your understanding, right, of the grace God has already given you. Yeah. So that's why he says grow in grace and knowledge. So that means for me in my walk, I need to have a greater understanding that there's no past sin that I've committed that can keep me from future service. Right? Same with you. So if a past sin has got you locked up in chains, you really, all that false humility, and I'm just trying to live better. I'm, I'm just a work in progress. Grace. Right? That's just an excuse not to serve. That's just an excuse to sit on the bench. That becomes an excuse just to waddle in pity and all that. How are you, how, how you just waddling in pity when Jesus died for the sin you waddling in? Hallelujah. Why are you sitting there any longer than you need to? Get up off the toilet, flush it, and keep going. That's what he said. That's just false pride, saints. Now, there are others who can't get past success. They draw pride from outward spirituality. Outward spirituality. These are people who can't get past it. I just described them. Yeah, you know, Pastor, um, this year I decided to give not 10% of my income, but I'm going to go 20. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. But why did you tell me? <laughs> why was that? What was the? Why have you let multiple people know what you plan on doing? You know, Pastor, I decided to. That's the sin of that prosperity mess. We got a $100 line, a $1,000 line, and a, a $1,500 line. So basically, they use the, the kind of natural, the natural proclivity that we all have to be honored 
They use that to their advantage. Because if you stick a line up with 15,000, five, and 250, don't nobody want to go to the 250 because we have associated with the more somebody gives, the more spiritual they are. So even a poor person will squeeze every dime to get to that 1,015 because they think an externally, I'm spiritual because I gave more. See how the church drives some of this, right? We all we honor everybody all the Now, the Bible says give honor where honors due. We got to be healthy with that. But when we create levels of spirituality, well, you know that person really spiritual. Oh, we, this one killed me. Oh, we want you to pray. You really can pray. There's no report card for prayer. Amen. There's no, there's no, God said, oh, they really can pray. Therefore, since they really can pray, you shut up. I don't want to hear from you. I want to hear from them because they can get their prayers up. That's heresy. God says, everybody can come to me. Yeah. I want all my children to talk to me, right? And my children, right, just like your own families, are all at different levels of spiritual growth. My baby here, right, all she can say, thank you, Dad, for, for dinner today. That God say, praise God, she's growing. And my older child, they can be more articulate. They can go deeper and all that. Do you think God values their prayer over the baby who's doing the best she can? So when you come to God, you don't need the pastor to stand there for you. You don't need me to get your prayer requests up and get it up. That is what the church has created, and it has created a false humility and outward spirituality. Amen. Look at the text now. Look at the text. Can't get past your successes. Number three, these are people who can't get past their trauma or pains. They draw pride from entitlement. Oh, Pastor, what you mean? Lord, you done, I have done this. I have been through that. I done been through this. You done took me through this. Therefore, since I've been through all of that, for your name, you owe me this. That's entitlement. All of what, Lord, I, I was persecuted and I stood tall. Lord, when I lost my job, I didn't repay evil for evil. Lord, when, when we were sick, I just stayed on my knees. Lord, I did all of these things for you. Therefore, since I did these for you, you owe me. Now, this one is me too. I've been here. And God gave me a scripture. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. It's another doxology. Who, have, who has known the mind of God or who has become his counselor? Watch this. Romans 11, 33 through 36, I believe. Mm -hmm. Who has known the mind of God or who has become his counselor? Who has given to God that it might be repaid to him? For from him, to him, and through him are all things. Watch, both now and forever. Boy, he hit me like a ton of bricks, but that was Sister Mary. <laughs> who has known the mind? Who has... Who has given to God that God now what? Needs to repay them. He helped me to see what I went through differently than how I was. Now instead of being bitter through it, and now God, when you go, I, I, I did it the way you said it, and this is how you repay me, right? I was righteous according to my understanding. I did it correctly according to the word of God. God said, so? <laughs> so? I love you, but so, I gave you enough for, like I said, the best gift that you ever going to get, I already gave to you Hallelujah. when you got saved. Yes. Everything after that is icing on the cake. Every breath you breathe, icing. Every uh, open door you get, icing. Yes. Every job you get, icing. Every check you get, icing. When you get God keep you safe in the store, bring your kids home from work, and all that kind of stuff, watch over your family. All of that is icing on the cake. He don't owe nobody, not one doggone thing. Right not a thing. Boy, he helped me. He hurt me with that one. Right here. My past trauma left me feeling entitled and owed by God. And God said, I ain't got no accounts with nobody. You ain't going to find God's own city banks, American Express, or none of that with an interest rate because he don't owe nobody a thing. It's us that always owes God. Hallelujah. When he hit me with that, thank you, Lord. Tears flow down the face. Thank you, Lord. Because he said, Lord said, you ought to count it a privilege to be persecuted for my name. You ought to count it a privilege to go through things according to my name. Lord, you mean 
That wasn't negative? No, it wasn't negative. It, that, that's something that is healthy for you in your spiritual walk. And when you come to heaven, I reward you in front of the whole world. But the reward ain't something he owes. Saints, I can keep going. We got two more principles. We're going to go over those next week. We, 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 we've, got, we've done good work. Effort is principle one. Get up. Get, I don't mean that literally. Saints, online, get up. Whoa, whoa. Open your Bibles. Get out your pajamas. Get ready. Uh, prepare. Um, study. Read. Reach out to saints. Evangelize. All of us still have plumbers coming to our house and, and electricians coming to our house and people fixing up. When they come over, pray for them. When you go get your hair done, pray for the people. When you get your nails done, ask them about do they know Jesus. Invite people to your effort, y'all. Get your hand on that sled and like just start pushing. Only do what you can do now. now. Don't start with 400 pounds. Maybe you can do 100 pounds first. Maybe do 25 pounds. But whatever you can do, get started. Number one, number two principle. Forget with lies behind. Amen. If you remember one thing, as Paul said, learn to forget. Saints, we thank you today. For those online, we thank you and appreciate you for coming out. But we, want, we don't want to leave this service without telling you about Jesus. Y'all, saints, you can't, I don't want you to start any of these principles. These are not the principles to good living. These are not the principles to starting your business. These are not, the, don't be trying to use these principles, although some of them work. Don't try to use them just to get a better life. You got to get saved first. Amen. You need Jesus before you need to start this process. Now, Jesus, he's not asking for your effort in salvation. He's asking for your heart. Yes. He's asking for your heart. Pastor, what does that mean, my heart? Well, when the Bible talks about heart, it's not talking about your physical heart. It's talking about the depths of your will and your desires. Where does your heart lie? Where does your desires lie? And right now, prior to you maybe hearing this sermon, prior to you hearing anything about Jesus, your desire lied in the fulfilling of your own desires and flesh that made you happy. When I was unsaved, I did what made myself happy. I was an idol to myself. But after salvation, God started to turn my desires, my affections, my loyalties to him instead of myself. You either have three idols, yourself, others, or the praises of people. So if that's, if that's three, if those three idols, you know, you got three idols, yourself, other people, or stuff. Your three idols are that. If you're worshiping stuff, at the end of it, when you have to face God, none of that's going to buy you into heaven. If you're worshiping the praises of people, you just like the name, you, you like, the, you like the, uh, the unchristian version of the Kardashians. You just got to be, you got to be talked about all the time. If that's you, you need Jesus. If you worship yourself, you need them. How do you become a Christian? First, you need to admit that you got problems. You got to admit you got a problem. Your problem ain't your mother. It ain't the trauma you've been through. It ain't the guy at the local uh, high school that flunked you in a math class. It ain't your, that ain't your problem. Your problem is yourself. All of us had the same problem. We got a sin problem in our hearts. Amen. If you are willing to put that and just give that to Christ and admit it, Get naked in front of God. You don't have to do that literally, but you have to get naked in front of God and say, God, you see everything, God. You see it all, Lord. Everything you, you see it all, I'm, I'm messed up. If that's you, you're a candidate for salvation. If you're willing to believe that God died for all the things that you were exposing to him, just died for it on the cross. He did it 2,000 years ago. The pastor said, how you know he did it? I wasn't there. You weren't there. I believe the historical records of it in the New Testament in my Bible. Yeah. And because of that New Testament act, built on the history of the saints, built on the writers of the New Testament, I trust what they say about this. Although I wasn't there, I trust their writings on this. Well, pastor, aren't you taking a leap of faith? Not really. We take leaps of faith all the time in our life. When we fly on the plane, we trust the pilot. When we go to school, we trust that what the teacher is telling us about history is true. When we go to our financial planner and we give them, we say, you can take $300 out of all my checks. We trust that they'll take that money and use it. We do that all the time. We trust people not knowing for sure, for sure, that what they're going to do is right. When the same in the New Testament, although you weren't there, I trust the historical narrative. And then the C is confess. Confess. What does that mean? Confess him as Lord. 
What does that mean? It means let him, let him be the director, master, and leader of your life. Don't let anybody else, friends, family, mother, children, father, boss, nobody, let him alone direct your life. If that's you, then you are a candidate for salvation. If you see this online and you need to talk to somebody, call the church, 734-728-3838. 734-728-3838 is our number. Please call us if that's you, but we want to call you back and just speak to you, hug you, minister to you, get you involved with the body, help you to in your new walk with Christ, and hopefully baptize you at some point. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you and praise you. Lord, we count it a privilege to come and worship your name, Lord. Although the sanctuary is relatively empty, I know you were here. I know you were here. And I know you're in the homes right now of Middle Belt Baptist Church members. I know you're there. So, Lord, I pray for all the families of NBC. Lord, I pray that you would keep them healthy physically. Then I pray that you keep them healthy mentally. Some of them are singles, and they don't talk to people every day. They go days without talking to people because everybody is, is locked in their homes. Lord, be with them, Lord. Be with them, Lord, um, because they, they need human interaction. You created us for relationships. You didn't create us to be alone and by ourselves. So I pray that you would meet their needs. I pray specifically for Pastor Hood, Lord. Lord, he's been faithful. Lord, you don't owe him a thing. You don't. You've given him so much and his family so much. But we come before you asking, Lord. You said in your word that we have not because we ask not. So, Lord, rather than us be, try to be spiritual and say, well, you know, we just want your will to be done, let's ask for what we want. And what I want, Lord, is that you would heal his body from head to toe. From head to toe, Lord. Remove it from his body, Lord Jesus. Remove it, Lord Jesus, by your grace. I know you still can heal. You may not heal with a touch, and I don't have the power to touch people and heal them, but all we need is the Spirit of God. He can do it. And Pastor Hood, I believe, has the Spirit of God in him, so I pray that for full healing of his body, Lord Jesus. Lord, if it be thy will that you would do that, Lord, ultimately we know that we have to accept whatever you say, but we won't pray for what we want, Lord. You want to know our heart with your children, so you want to know specifically what we want. We want you to give him several more decades, Lord, on this earth, Lord to continue to do your work, Lord. I pray for his wife, Lord. Sometimes folks forget the wife. Lord, when you're married and you're one with somebody, you go through the same thing they go through, Lord. So I pray and ask that you would give her a peace that passes all understanding. Something that only she can understand and explain, Lord Jesus. Give her strength, Lord. Give her good health, Lord, as she becomes his primary caretaker right now. Give her the right words to say, to give her the strength to, to continue to persevere. When she gets weak, Lord, make her strong, Lord. When her anxiety and worry starts to heighten, Lord, I pray and ask that you would show her that you are God she can stick to and, you stick, and you're closer to her than even her own family, Lord. You said you would never leave us nor forsake us. So let her know that you are right there with her. Every doctor's appointment, every exam, every chemotherapy, whatever they got to go through in the testing, MRIs, you are right there in that room before they even get there. So I praise you for that. Then all his children, Lord, I know that it's just a worry. He's such a, a, a strong, a big pillar in their life. Lord, I, I pray even now that through his situation, they will continue to grow even stronger in their relationship to you, Lord. Help them to see you more than they even do him in this matter, Lord. Help them to see, oh my God, we serve a good God, despite what's going on in his body, Lord. So use his health and physical situation to bring glory and honor to your own self. I pray all these things in thy son Jesus' name. Amen. This thing's one we stand together for the ones that's in here. We got a house full of people up in here. You know, cut the angels up in here. We got a house full of folk. 1 Timothy 3.16. Oh, y'all ain't getting no help today, huh? <laughs> For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by the angels, preached among the nations, and believed on in the world. This says we thank you and praise you for this service. 
I pray and ask that, that godly will, will God will bless you as we leave this place. Saints, I'll see you tonight on the Zoom at 6 p.m. Amen. Amen, amen.